The Buddha has us reflect on the body. As he says, it's nourished by rice, but it's subject to abrasion and wearing down. And the same applies to the mind. It's nourished by its food, but it's also subject to abrasion and wearing down. We live in a world where there's a lot of very unpleasant things. Things that threaten to wear the mind down. We have to figure out some way to find the strength not to be worn down. And with the body, when you're young, you don't see the wearing down that much. Because the body is good at regenerating itself. So you don't have a sense of how toxic the environment is. But as the body begins to lose that ability to regenerate itself, then you see it wearing down, wearing down. The environment that nurtures us is also the environment that kills us. But with the mind, the mind doesn't have to be killed. In other words, its energy, its goodness doesn't have to be killed. We can keep on regenerating it. This is what the role of rapture is in the practice. It's a quality that's not very well defined in the canon. The commentary talks about five kinds of rapture. I can't remember all of them right offhand, but they include a sense of a chill going through the body, a wave of emotion going over the body, your hair standing on end. Some of the really extreme examples, I know people who start just chanting or saying things, the body moving around very strongly. But there are also weaker manifestations, a sense of fullness. John Lee talks about this a lot. This relates to another way of translating the Pali term pity, which we usually translate as rapture. It also can be translated as refreshment. In the factors for awakening, it follows on persistence. So you have to ask yourself, what kind of persistence would give rise to that feeling of refreshment? It gives you an idea of where your efforts should go as you're focused on the breath. What kind of breath would be refreshing right now? What way of conceiving the breath would be refreshing? The Buddha says that you develop this factor for awakening also by looking for the potentials for refreshment inside and learning how to attend to them. And John Lee makes this comment as a generalization. We have lots of potentials in the body and in the mind that we don't make use of. And so we should learn how to focus right here. What are our potentials? This is one of the reasons why there's such a strong emphasis in the forest tradition on paying careful attention to what you're doing as you go through the day, all of your tasks in the monastery, even simple things like sweeping. There's a right way and a wrong way to sweep. You want to make sure that when you sweep you don't blow the dust up into the air, and that you actually do a thorough job. There's a right and a wrong way to wipe down a wooden floor, to clean a spittoon, all the very simple things. And on the one hand, being very attentive to this makes you look at the details, though it does threaten to get obsessive. But if you're looking for a way to keep the mind getting away, to keep the mind from getting into abstractions, this is a good way to do it. Because we tend to think wisdom is a matter of abstractions, and it's not. It's a matter of skill. Skill in seeing what is the right thing to do. And of course, primarily, what are the right things to do in the mind? So you want to be able to watch what the mind is doing while it's doing it. And you get good practice in that, watching yourself as you're sweeping, as you're cleaning up as you're doing chores in the orchard. Be very close to the body, very close to the activities that you're doing right now. And think about what would be a skillful way of doing them, rather than just doing the job to get it over with. And then you can bring that same attitude into the mind when you sit down to meditate. 
So as you're sitting and breathing, you're not just pumping air in and out. You're asking yourself, what's the nature of this energy? Where does the energy come from? When you breathe in, the air comes in from outside, but the energy originates inside the body. What are the spots where it does? And John Lee mentions a few. But where are the prominent spots in your own body? Where it seems like as soon as the breath starts coming in, or the air starts coming in, there's something radiating from that spot. Look at it carefully. Is there anything getting in the way? What are the spots that are most sensitive to the in and out breath? Can you hover around those spots? Watch them as you breathe in. What does it feel like? As you breathe out, what does it feel like? Is there any sense of squeezing it at any point in the breath cycle? If there is, stop breathing in or stop breathing out, whichever is doing the squeezing. And see if you can keep a sense of being open. This is one of the skills we need to develop as we develop concentration. Some people complain about the word concentration as a translation for samadhi. But it's very much a matter of the mind being centered, and all the activities of the mind being centered around it. So there's something concentric about it. But the skill lies in not putting a lot of force and tension on, this, on that center that you're trying to maintain. In fact, it's just the opposite. As you focus on the center, think of it as being open. Whatever energy is there is allowed to flow out. Whatever good energy is there can flow out. Bad energy, if there's any there, let that flow out too. In other words, you're not putting a shell around it. And this is the quality of concentration that you want, centered but open, with no squeeze on that spot. And then you hover around and maintain it. And that's how the refreshment can begin to develop. That spot's not being squeezed, it's not being run over. As you go running off to look at something else, you're giving it some space. Because it is a problem, nor ordinarily, as we focus on things outside. We don't pay much attention to the energy quality in the body, and so we run roughshod over it as we try to focus on this, that, or the other thing. But here we're allowing the energy centers in the body to be open and nourished. And when good energy is there, it's allowed to flow out. Now you want to see, are there any blockages anywhere, any walls that you put up around it? Can you think of them dissolving away? What you're doing is that you're allowing that spot of the body to be free from any abrasion from the mind. And when it's free from abrasion, it can regenerate itself. That's where the refreshment comes from. As I said, it may manifest through the body in different ways. But what you want is that sense of refreshment. That's what's nourishing for the concentration. This is only when that sense of refreshment is allowed to spread through the body that it can calm down in a way that's not sleepy and tired. It calms down with energy. That's what you want. So look for these potentials in the body. Keep your attention very close. Right here, right here. Because otherwise, you, as you look outside or think outside, this gets trampled on. And no sense of energy, no sense of refreshment is allowed to develop. But 
but if you can get in touch with these centers inside and protect them, the refreshment can begin to spread. This is how you get the energy to keep on practicing. This, as John Fuang said, is the lubricant for the meditation. He says, just as an engine needs lubricant in order not to seize up, the same way your concentration needs lubricant, your meditation needs lubricant, the sense of refreshment, so that it doesn't run dry. <laughs>